Hey, welcome to Wandering DMs. Uh, I'm Dan. Hi, I'm Isabel. And today on Wandering DMs, we're going to be talking about uh, D&D art in the 90s. In the and 90s. This is the third volume of our series that we do about once a year here. And I'm so happy that I managed to get some time with Brooklyn-based uh, artist and actor uh, Isabel Garbani, uh, um, who has appeared at many other times on our channel and not That's so much right. lately. So, Isabel, thank you so much. You're welcome. Our, this is one of the more popular um, show series that we do, actually. So, thank you so much for giving us some of your... Uh, your very valuable time today to talk about D&D art in the 90s. Art in the 90s, back when we were young. <laughs> Ish. <laughs> no, we were young then. Now we're young-ish. <laughs> Ish. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you used to appear uh, more frequently on our channel, obviously. That's true. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll remind viewers, Isabel has a Master in Fine Arts uh, from the New York Academy of Art here. So I'm perfectly qualified to talk about art and art-related subjects. Very qualified. Some of our patrons uh, from week to week have been asking why is Isabel... So the, the, the number one thing that you would appear on a regular basis was our Book of War Wargaming shows on Saturdays. Um, yeah. And we haven't been able to get the schedules uh, right to do that on a regular basis, unfortunately, right. which which pains me to no end. And our patrons... Because regular... you were winning all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was running slightly more than half the time, just slightly. Yeah. And we're sufficiently competitive that I understand that would hurt. That would hurt me if I was on the receiving end of it. Yeah. So our patrons regularly ask what you've been up to. What have you been up to lately? What have I been? That's uh, that's a good question. What's uh, what's Isabel in twenty twenty two like? Uh, twenty twenty two. Well, you know, ups and downs. There've been some really, uh, you know great uh, 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 projects and acting and classes and, you know, meeting people and doing background work and thing like, things like that. And then uh, some uh, not so great things. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, good and bad. Um, uh, you know, lately a little ch more challenging, I guess. You know, uh, we've had some... Uh, cancellations of a you know the show that I was that I was in that was that's been a right. little hard to digest right. uh, but you know moving on and uh, you know had a whole bunch of auditions uh, last week and doing some self tapes this week so basically yeah that's the life of uh, of Isabel these days uh, doing I mean, auditions and I uh, hoping somebody picks me pick me pick me <laughs> You know, I mean, in the past couple of months, I mean, you've done a number of uh, indie film projects. Yep. I mean, you were in Philadelphia filming a thing a couple of weeks ago. That's true. A couple of things showed up on YouTube. Yep. Um, so um, hopefully more of that. Now, and, and in addition, I think we wanted to mention uh, the tour guiding that you do in New York. Yes. Yeah. So I stopped teaching during the pandemic. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of people who were adjuncting, you know, stopped just because there were no jobs and had to do something else. Me is because I realized I don't like teaching. <laughs> a, a, a reasonable, <laughs> a potentially reasonable viewpoint. Uh, and, you know, a friend of mine had mentioned that, you know, I should do tour guiding and I, you know, I get my license, my, my New York City tour guiding license. And I started doing a lot of, um, uh, 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 tour guides, uh, uh, guided tours at uh, the Met. So, you know, art tours. And, you know, the company I work for gives me a lot of leeway as to uh, the script so I could, I could do whatever I wanted. And so I thought that could actually be something that I could bring to the table today is like some of the stuff that I do during um, those guided tours with, um, um, you know, with folks who are not necessarily like uh, artists or, you know, know a lot about art, you know, and feel that they have to go to the Met because it's on the bucket list and it's like this like, you know, the biggest museum in the U.S. So, you know, you know, got to go see that. But they don't know where to start or what they're looking at. And so my job is trying to kind of, like, make them figure out, like, why we care about some of the stuff that we look at. Um, and I thought that would be kind of interesting to bring some of that to cool. today's show. Cool. If that's okay with you. I think that's, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that's awesome we get to, get to hear from your perspective on that. Yeah. Now, to be clear, the Met is? Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, so biggest museum in the U.S., um, you know, very overwhelming. Even for me, you know, to, to go there is, you know, can be a little overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff that I don't know is even there. You know, they had like, you know, many, 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 many departments and, you know, spans like thousands of years of, you know, human civilization. So, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, very comprehensive uh, 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 collection of a lot of art from a lot of different perspectives. 
So I, I love going to the Met, and the couple times that you and I have gone with friends or family members, they always come away and go, Isabel is an amazing guide. <laughs> She's so fantastic. Um, Thank you. And, uh, and while we were chatting about that, uh, our friend Ragnar is saying that uh, he saw the short horror oh, film yeah, right. that you were in and thought it was great. Which is fantastic. What, remind us what the name of that is. So that's called The Perfect Daughter. And I play a murderer. And I think uh, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being cast for it. That's a lot of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess, you know, you got to have a type. So my type is the psychopath. <laughs> so, i got to embrace that. You, know? <laughs> you do a good aggressive crazy. I do a good, you know, because in, in February I actually was also in another... Mm-hmm. Um, in another short film yeah. that, you know, is not um, out yet, yeah. where I played um, a psychopath. I, I actually kill my daughter at the end of that show. It's like, oh my God. I'm a nice person, I swear. <laughs> or maybe I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a release. I, you know, I hear other actors say that it's a good, you know, it's a release, and, you know, and they're very different from the roles that they play. Yeah, there you go. Good for them. <clears throat> there you go. <clears throat> I'm very different in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so before we get into D and D art of the '90s, um, uh, let me let me set a little bit of historical context. So, D and D in the '90s, um, in 1990, they came out with a second edition of the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons game, which is what the, the main line was called at the time. So, uh, they make about a new edition about once every decade. So, 1990, they had a second edition come out. Come out, and the '90s are primarily known for setting source books. So there was this crazy proliferation, this explosion of different campaign settings. And you'd get a boxed set, and here's D&D in space, or here's D&D post-apocalyptic, or here's D&D in a hollow world, or here's D&D in a, in a number of different possible settings. And it's it, they've never had as many settings come out one after the other as they did in the 90s. Mm. So in theory, um, like actually, uh, Shannon Applecline, who we've had on the show before, who's a D&D historian, has said that the, the campaign settings of this period have a strong artistic design. Mm-hmm. So at least in theory, um, every setting ought to have a specific visual <clears throat> appearance that should distinguish it from the other campaign settings. So I guess I'm kind of be interested in whether you see that or not, or whether the overall idiom is 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 not as distinct as i might think it to be actually mm. um so that's what i'm going to be looking for here um <laughs> uh, so yeah I, i'm glad you're on the show because if you're if you're if you're a spe- and ragnar's reminding us if you are a specialist in horror movies our, our D games are mostly just horror mo- horror <laughs> stories all the time so it really fits perfectly well i'm so glad you're here today <laughs> <laughs> so let's look I'm not at, a specialist I just play one on TV <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's start by looking at Jeff Easley so Jeff we, we actually talked about Jeff Easley in uh, our prior installment of this looking at artists of the 80s so Jeff was Easley was probably the the, the prince of number one artist like in the late 80s to early 90s so they tasked him with making the covers of the of the brand new core rule books for D&D and um, I guess I should also remind viewers that you know, when we do this, we mostly focus on cover art, admittedly. So in our limited limited time, limited access, and things that look good on screen, we are mostly focused on cover art. That might possibly bias our analysis, and I apologize for that. So feel free in the chat to tell us about things that, you know, you wish that we'd looked at or other artists that we don't have time to talk about today. But I want to look at some of Jeff Easley's art for core rule books. So, Actually, before you start... Mm-hmm. Um, so let me go back to like the, the tour guiding thing that uh, was going to be like my whole, you know, um, uh, I don't know, uh, gestalt, whatever right. you want to call it today. Theme. So the theme, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm really well spoken as a tour guide, I swear. <laughs> 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 um, so basically, you, you know, the idea is that when I take people on, on, on the tour of the museum, I try to put things in context so that they understand like why the art looks the way it does. And generally I say, you know, um, the art is telling you something about the cultural context. So you can find clues as to, you know, what was going on, you know, maybe politically or geographically or culturally or whatever, you know, like things, or maybe, you know, like uh, big events that were, that were happening, you know, and that can be reflected in the art. So, um, you know, when, when we look at, um, 
uh, like the, because we're doing D and D, like the end of uh, you know medieval art, you know, and why you know suddenly you have you know this switch to Renaissance art, and you know of course the switch is not like you know instantaneous, but you know there's like this slow switch. You know, I talk about the Black Death and the fact that you know uh, half of Europe is dead and people are questioning the authority of the church, and so you know they they they're questioning um, you know thematically what they want to look at, you know, so in a very broad term. So I was thinking that when we were looking at the art of the 90s, because I think there is a lot more diversity in style that maybe we can try to like dig in into what was happening in the 90s. And can we can we actually look at the art and figure out like why, you know, all of a sudden you have something that's actually a little bit more interesting to me than the art of the 80s. Fair? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, immediately before the show, we had a little chat, and I and I suggested maybe don't get too dark on the show. And so within ten <laughs> minutes, we immediately went to Black Plague, half of Europe dead, and uh, obviously uh, that doesn't connect to stuff that we've been living through for the last two years and all no. the traumatized. So good job, good job, wandering Man. DMs, no, uh, Dan and Isabel. We've done it. Have a happy Sunday. Y- usually, it's me that does this. So thank you for. Thank you for... For being the bad guy? Yeah, exactly. I am cast as the bad guy for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, so a piece from Jeff Easley. So this, we're looking at uh, what was used for the cover of what was called the D&D Rule Cyclopedia. So it was this big hardcover compilation of like 10 years of what's called the basic D&D line. And uh, Jeff was doing a lot of uh, paintings here for the covers I think this is technically called Encounter in the Marsh or something like that. Mm-hmm. And you've got a knight on a horse facing probably what's a black dragon um, lurching out at him. Uh, comments about this? Comments about this. You know, you know what I think I like a lot about what we're going to see is the, the changes in, in the, the, the color palette. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the, you know, the one thing that I really did not like uh, about a lot of the art that we looked in the 90s, and I hate to be negative. The 80s. Uh, the 80s, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Um, is you know, it seemed the, the, the colors were very, um, I don't know, very uh, very bright and, 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 and kind of garish. And here, you know, it seems a little bit, everything was a little bit more toned down and more subtle, you know, even though, you know, this is, you know, you've got this big red thing coming at you. Uh-huh. Um, there's something I don't know. This this there's something about it that's that seems a little bit more subtle, you know. And you've got you know the dragon that's kind of fading into the background and you know becoming this you know big kind of orb of light mm-hmm. in the back, and you just kind of like imagine how big this thing is going to be, um, I, you know. So I, anyway, to to me that's the big the big change is like the the, the color palette, you know, and. Nice. And maybe maybe the printing process has you know changed. Maybe there's like more uh, computerized uh, printing process at the time that you know lets you have more subtle colors. I don't know. You know that would be it would be kind of like interesting to know about that. Um, Let me pull up now. I feel like um, I don't remember. Remind how I remind myself why I pull up another piece here. <laughs> so here is I think this was Jeff Easley's cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide, and I feel it's got a sl- at least a slightly similar feel to it. Yeah, uh, this is like very circular. Yeah, right? One character yeah. fighting a dragon with yeah. kind of colorful uh, pastel, I guess? Yeah. Colors around the edges. Yeah. So I guess it was successful. Yeah. I guess it was a successful piece. Yeah. Right. But you know, it's funny because we, we, when we, I mean, it's, it's not funny, haha, but when we were looking at the pieces that you had pulled, you know, I, I, to me, what I what I when I think of D and D artwork, I I guess what I remember is the stuff from the '90s, and I thought that that was like the typical stuff. And okay. when we started digging into okay. the '70s and '80s, I was like, oh right, that is not the typical typical stuff. And maybe it's because that's when I actually started learning about D and D. You know, and I I was seeing you know that stuff. Okay. Uh, but to me, that was kind of like you know. The, the typical artwork was actually, you know, with the, the two pieces that you just uh, showed us. Okay, okay. So. Now, Ragnar's pointing out that those, piece, those pieces are technically from 1989. Yes. But um, the uh, I, I feel that it set the tone for the 90s. Yeah. Right? And so second edition technically came out in 1990. Um, and so it, it was what you had at the table 
mm-hmm. those books are what you had at the table through the 90s, basically. So I feel like you had your eyeball on that stuff a lot through the 90s. Now, here's one other piece from um, Easily. Uh, I want to bring it up here. Okay, so among the settings in the 1990s, there was a setting called al Qadim or Arabian Adventures. And so this was a setting um, based on the mythology of the Middle East, of Arabia, and it was themed on the Thousand and One Nights mm-hmm. um, kind of thing. And um, so they had they had this kind of art with, you know, genies and Afrit and the things like that in the sands and Arabian inspired um, stuff. Um, and now I, as we as we talk about this, we can't avoid the the cultural issues nowadays. So on the one hand, someone could point to this and say it's inclusive and it's bringing in you know ideas from different mythologies. And there are some people nowadays that would say that this was insensitive. And it didn't involve people themselves from the Middle East who are creators and that it's highly mythologized and doesn't use enough of the actual real world culture. So I guess we have to be careful about that. Um, does this does this style look a lot different from Jeff Easley's other pieces or is it just m- more very, very similar to the other stuff that he was doing? You know, in some ways, actually, it, there's a lot of similarities. You see, you still yeah. have like kind of like this... Right. You know, he's got this circle uh-huh. that, you know, seems to be like, you know, like, this is how I'm going to start. I'm going to have this giant circular, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, you know, motion going all the way around. And then everything is going to be around. It's going to be this giant thing and then this little thing that are kind of like chasing each other. So, you know, in some ways that's um, that's very similar. Um Right? Am I am I crazy? But, oh, I totally you know. agree. I totally agree. Um, but so yeah, but you know, so let's talk about that. You know, so go, you know, going back to like uh, you, you know the the stuff that I talk about, you know, with um, with with tourists that are on my tour, you know. Um, so what's happening in the nineties? I think it's like this is the start of like actually people trying to be more inclusive, you know, in on TV and you know in 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 media in general, mm-hmm. you know. And maybe it's awkward, maybe it's not completely successful, maybe it's not like, you know, but this is this is when the term like politically correct, you have to be politically mm-hmm. correct, you know, starts to be coined, you know, and some people are very unhappy about that. Right. Um, but, you know, I think maybe that is why we start seeing more diversity in the um, style of artwork. Um, you know, people are trying to be a little bit more open to something that is not necessarily, you know, European based slash Western based, mm-hmm. you know, art. You know, and be, you know, look elsewhere and say, like, well, you know, maybe there are interesting stories and interesting artwork. And I think, you know, some of the stuff that we were talking about, uh, you know, before the show, like some of the stuff that we, we're going to see definitely have influence, uh, you know, of like Chinese art and Japanese art, you know, um, and, and, and things like that, that, you know, you know, people who were creating grew up with, you know, um, so yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> all right, yeah, and I mean, so I th- I, I think I agree that um, you know easily style there didn't uh, change a whole lot from um, con- from content item from campaign to campaign, I guess. Right. Um, and he did a lot of other stuff, and there were other artists working on the Al Qadim Arabian setting. Um, it's funny because you know they had they had a book that was the, the very first book in the series was called Arabian Adventures. So here's now here now Dan's tripping over the third rail issue. So in the in the eighties there was a book called I think I can say this out loud. There was a book called Oriental Adventures, and that gets an enormous amount of flack nowadays. Right. Right. And then the the Al Qadim setting started with a book called Arabian Adventures, and it doesn't get anywhere near as much flack. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for, 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 as, as far as criticism of that goes, so oh, maybe you just get getting it started, getting the great, ball rolling. Great, if you didn't know about Arabian <laughs> Adventures, yes, at some point. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so anyway, the, 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 the hope would be that it's inclusive and, and and that you know people get some of their mythology. It's not it's not real world. Some of their fantasy reflected uh, in the game would be would be the hope and. I get to learn a little bit about somebody else's mythologies. Right. One thing that I like from D&D, frankly. And if I, want to, if I want to learn more about the real world, I can start reading an actual history book once I, once I get inspired from that. 
Um, yeah, right? Pretty pretty obvious callbacks to those things. Now, as soon as I said, we're going to be talking about art in the 90s, our viewers immediately said, we're going to be talking about Brahm and Tony Dieterlitzi. So, of course, we're going to be talking about them. So, uh, there's an artist that basically goes with the, by the single name Brahm. I believe his full name is Gerald Brahm, but we just call him Brahm. And so he was the lead artist on the campaign setting called Dark Sun. And Dark Sun is actually a fairly well-regarded setting. It's a, it's a post-apocalyptic setting, kind of like Dune, mm. um, in which the theme is that the technology of the world, which is magic, has caused an environmental collapse. And the environment and life of the planet has collapsed as a result of that. And people are in this post-apocalyptic situation trying to survive and fight their way out of horrible fascist governments that have taken over as a result. Hmm. <clears throat> Total fantasy. Total fantasy. It uh, never happened. So, so, they, so, so Brahm was the primary artist of Dark Sun, and I, I think many of us think that it's, he's, his work was very distinct. So let me go grab a... Again, that's the um, Jeff Easley piece there. So I'll go get... So... Here, here's a piece that you spotted, and, and we usually leaf through the Art and Arcana book before we do these. So here's a piece that you came into my room and you said, this is a thing that, pop, pop, that popped out at me. Right. So that's a particular character named Neva uh, by Gerald Brom. And from what it says in the write-up in Art and Arcana, he made this painting, and then that actually inspired the whole campaign world. Right, yeah, you were saying that. So between him and other people, that was a strong enough piece that it's a, we're going to make a whole campaign world basically just around this idiom. Uh, why did that pop out to you? Well, you know, so the one thing we're... And again, you know, I hate to like harp on the 80s, you know, over and over again. But when we're looking at um, the artwork of the 80s, you know, the way women were portrayed and women warriors were portrayed, it was kind of like this very... Uh, silly boobalicious you know uh you know kind of you know kind of portrayal of women you know um and here you know you know obviously you still have a, a lot of sexuality you know in in you know this portrayal of women you know like you you know like she's probably i hope she would be like more covered than that you know if she were to actually go into battle you know and not 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 hurt herself but you know at the same time you know she looks like she could really crush you you know with just you know two of her fingers so you know she's so on the one hand you know she's still you know very much sex sexualized mm -hmm. uh, you know as a woman but you know she's also like way 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 stronger than we've seen or that you know that i remember seeing you know from the the stuff previously so, you know, I, I, I was like, well, maybe, you know, uh, roles of women were changing. Maybe, you know, things were, you know, getting a little bit better for women in the workforce. Maybe there were more uh, people, you know, who had a voice at the table, you know, and, and women had like more, uh, more of a voice at the table, um, you know, in, in the early 90s, possibly. Anyway, she's, she's very strong. You know, and I, I kind of like that. So even though, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, she's still very scantily clad, right. you know, and like, <laughs> that might hurt in battle. But, you know, at the same time, she's like, you know, powerful. And, right. you know, you and you can't deny the power that she right. has, which is kind of nice. She's very muscular. <clears throat> she's very muscular. So it seemed it was it was a little bit, at least in the 90s, of a, of a opening up yeah. body types yeah. that were acceptable. Now, let me go... Um, Remembering, I gotta click this here. Um, so here's a, here's a larger piece. So this was uh, again by Brahm. So this was like this is a wraparound cover. So that you're looking at front and oh, back. Oh yeah, gotcha. Uh, cover of a single hardcover book, I believe. Um, so and you can see kind of the, the desolate, you know, sandy desert dune type world. Uh, I, I I suppose you could defend thematically. Again, the Neva picture came first. You could def you could defend thematically. Is it the characters started out as gladiatorial slaves, mm, right? Gotcha. So they were they were dressed like gladiators to show off their bodies and actually increase the damage in the gladiatorial pit. So you have oh, to start off right. You have to start off without armor and fight your way out of the gladiatorial pits, and maybe someday you'll ever get armor. Got it. Got it. Was the idiom there? Now, of course, that is a nice little excuse for why everybody, male and female, are half. Half, Half naked. naked, right? Right, uh, and it, and it's also hot. 
Sure. Right, and it's the the the, the world has overheated and it's right. hot everywhere, so you can't wear heavy armor. Um, but everybody in the setting, male and female, was all like this. Now, again, the cultural the cultural sensitivity issues here are: is it okay to have a, a campaign setting where you start off as slaves, and where that's a major component of the campaign, the, the world structure? and the character's identity. Mm. Nowadays, a lot of people would probably say that you don't want to foist that on players. Um, but that was the, um, you know, at least starting off with his gladiatorial sense. Right. Um, everybody looked like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that, I mean, in terms of like the, uh, the choice of, the, the choice of, uh, uh, you know, what people look like, that makes sense. Mm. Um, and, you know, I can see like that apply to men and women, you know, like and actually in that in that particular um, uh, illustration, the woman like way in the back has more clothes right. on than the guy, you know, you know that's right. immediately behind the uh, the right. main character here right. uh, on on the right. So you know that's kind of interesting, but you know, but um, but you know, I, some of that stuff I kind of like having a callback to you know real culture and real cultural. Yeah. Um, uh, constructs, you know, I, you know, so, you, you know, you can look at, you know, uh, the Roman circus and, you know, kind of find some inspiration in that, yeah. you know, and actually make the artwork a little bit more uh, clever because of it, or at least, you know, justify some of it, you know, which I think is interesting to, to me, that's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, to kind of like dig into like why that was happening, you know, in Roman time. And, you know, can we, can we play with that a little bit? You know. I agree, and I, I think many of our, our viewers who have posted comments in the last couple of minutes, um, you know, are on the same page with that. Mm -hmm. I, I constantly say, like, I literally don't know anything that I didn't ultimately learn from D&D, &D, right. as you know. So every piece of, you know, history that I dig into was in some way inspired or something I hoped would, would fold back into my D&D &D game. So for me, D&D &D has been the opportunity to learn about things that I otherwise wouldn't know right. are interesting, either about real world <clears throat> or mythology or literature in some way. So I'm 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 very thankful that these things have inspired me to to go out and learn right. more real history about like you right. know, Roman times or something right, like that. Right, right, right. Um. Let me pick one more. <laughs> um, let me pick one more thing from Brom here. Um, do any, oh, you wanted to talk about this, right? Yeah, this one. I I guess you know again because I really like the color palette of that. You know because it's so different from what we've seen before, and it feels you know, uh, more subtle, more subdued, you know, I love the composition, you know, the little triangle that yeah. you have, you know, the red triangle with, you know, the, the figures in the back, you yeah. know, that you can kind of see. And that's, that almost looks like, um, uh, I don't know, like a Egyptian relief or something, you know, nice. uh, you know, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm thinking about. It looks like a, the Greek vase, there you, you know. Go. There you, go. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. you know, yeah, and I, you know, I'm, I'm like, how can I not see that? You know, I talk <laughs> about that all the time. The black figure and the red figure of the Greek vase, you know. So you right. have, you know, those things in battle, you know, in the back. Uh, I don't know. This it's just a really nice composition, you know. Um, uh, you know, uh, and 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 again, maybe maybe the inspiration is, you know, those. Greek and Roman mythologies, you know, that, you know, I, I, I think are perfectly okay to get inspired to. But, you know, but the, but the colors remind me also of um, some of the watercolors that I see in, um, in the, uh, the Asian uh, uh, wing of the, of the okay. Met, where, okay. you know, uh, we go through um, uh, the Chinese uh, traditional painting uh, wing, where you have a lot of scroll paintings, uh, and the colors are very subtle. You know, and it's 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 a lot of ink drawings and a lot of like, I don't know, some some of those watercolors really remind me of, of some of the stuff that I see in, in the landscape painting and the uh, traditional Chinese scroll paintings. Yeah. And William in the chat is saying the, the same thing that I was just about to say is that he's channeling, uh, Brahm here is channeling a lot of composition elements from Frank Frazetta, who uh, painted a lot of Conan book covers right, back right, in the right, day right, right, so right. they're not they're not copies but they they're at least echoing the there's a famous frazetta uh, painting of conan you know again solo against a large number of of, of opponents there and, and beating them all right frankly i tend to you actually i tend to use that frazetta painting as a representation of D, &D sweep attacks eighth level and the enemy's first level i get eight attacks per round so i actually tend to use that as a representation of um 
sweep attacks in traditional D&D, as a matter of fact. You know, it's funny, you know, with the, with the, it's, it's funny over time because the, um, the original Frazetta painting, right, he's, he's Conan's fighting men. And here they've, you know, transitioned to kind of inhuman uh, mm. serpent monsters. And um, it's kind of interesting how you, the, um, the inhumanity of the opponent has to evolve over time to become more and more inhuman to be acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah in terms of like the violence yeah yeah, right, yeah i right. can see that and ultimately that. it turns into either uh, zombies which is pretty much with either zombies or robots those are always yeah. acceptable yeah 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 <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw up just one last thing before we get off Braun here sure um who i think is very interesting like uh either this or this look at this or this mm-hmm. yeah, that this. one is that one is nice okay yeah. so so there's sort of a um Queen of the Underworld type thing. I might mm-hmm. I might refer to this as. Um, um, so again, he's got a lot of he's got a lot of strong women in his paintings, um, and some sort of queen archmage casting a spell here. I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, does that uh, does that remind you of anything? <laughs> 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 we can just move on if you don't want to talk about that. <laughs> no, I, 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 maybe. Okay. Well, we, Queen of the Underworld. Oh, oh, because of the 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 yeah. the, the, the role I've been I've been cast right. as Queen of the Underworld in right. the film, but it hasn't right. happened yet. Right. So, and it's right. I, I I might have been fired from that. So oh, really? I don't know. Yeah. Really? Well, I haven't heard from what? the guy in a couple of weeks. Okay, but so it's a little. <laughs> anyway, it's it's surprisingly <laughs> like the outfit that. Um... Yeah, uh, a little too inside baseball. You mm. know. Um, so all right. Anyway, moving on. so you know, very very nice composition again. You know, it's uh, that's that's, you know, very very. Uh, Anyway, let's move on. It kind of yeah. reminds me of like Hella from the, from the last uh, Thor movie, actually. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 very much so. So we, we knew that we were going to talk about uh, Gerald Brom, and we knew that we were going to talk about uh, Dieter Lisi, who also has a very, to me, a very um, specific and unique style. Yeah, I, we, we, like a lot of our the D&D fans, you see a piece by Dieter Lisi, you immediately know who was doing it. Mm. Um, so let me go grab one of those. Oh yeah. Um, okay, oh, yeah. let's start with this, right? Yeah. Okay. So in the um, in the Art and Arcana book, this is a like an artist's featured image where Dieter Lisi himself picked this as one of the favorite things that he did for D and D. And I guess I should set the groundwork. So the campaign sitting here was called Planescape, which is D and D in other dimensions. You can travel to hell. You can travel to heaven. You can travel to Asgard. You mm-hmm. can travel the the known planes. And it kind of opens up a whole lot of alien, foreign dimension type, Doctor Strange type travel, I suppose. Uh, so here you've got um, three adventurers, I guess, confronting what I think is a demon. Kind of, it's got some lizard draconic qualities to it. Why does that? You know, honestly, I wouldn't have picked that as like an outstanding piece. Why does that uh, pop out to you and Tony D. Terlizzi himself? I mean, I I love I I first of all I love the composition is is really quite beautiful, and I think to me because the um, the the ink work is not perfect, so you have like kind of the uh, a very loose sense of like you know the brush strokes and you know like especially for the smoke and the and the stone, you know um I don't know it feels uh it, you know it feels like you you know you see the person behind it. You know, you kind of, you know, it's like there's some a human being created that and they weren't trying to be perfect, you know, so I really love that. And I love the fact that the, so, you know, I thought it was a dragon. You think it's not a dragon, but, you know, maybe, you know, it's a, some other monster, you know, it's not the typical dragon that we've seen so far. So right. all the stuff that you've shown me before, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, you know, that's, that's the dragon that, you know, I, I see all the time. And this is kind of like a very gargoyly and you know really kind of uh ugly and menacing and half human and you know with a big kind of soft belly and you know there's something kind of beautiful or repulsive at the same time you know uh and again you know because i i I kind of i kind of feel the brush strokes there i feel like the 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 ink work you know like i feel the the person behind it and i like that a lot 
Nice. I guess um, I'm just noticing kind of like the spotted stippling like around the sides of yeah. the belly and stuff, legs and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. You know, and that's kind of echoed in the, in the, some of the stones. So whatever's on his belly, it's kind of like echoed on the stone. It's just like, yep. and echoed also on her, um, yep. if you look at the, uh, the I don't know if, the, if it's the a cape. Far right figure. On the far right, you know, um, it's, it's kind of like this cape that's kind of uh, going down. And yeah. it's it's almost echoed in that as well. Yeah. So it's just like, is everything getting infected? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, or, or, you know, it's part of the same world anyway. So, you know, it's just like, you know, really nice choices. And I like, I like the, the you know, the watercolory quality of of the smoke and the stones you know to, like to me that's that's just really beautiful and again you know it reminds me of other types of artwork so it's not just you know the uh very clean kind of a renaissance painting uh you know mm -hmm. uh you know there's like different ways to actually make artwork and different ways to use the material and this kind of like is the first time that I feel the artist is not trying to be like completely perfect and clean, if that makes any sense. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing I like about Dieter Lisi's art here, and I, and I think the three characters on the right, I think are elves. I mean, they've got pointed ears and they're, you know, kind of oddball colors. Um, is I like that the, the characters are frail, right? Again, as someone who, you know, has a concept of traditional D&D &D as, as a war game and a horror game, the characters are frail and likely to be shattered. Mm. And it feels like that in this piece and other Dieter Lisi, they feel mortal. They feel human and actually at risk ra rather than some art that makes everybody, a, you know, a Schwarzenegger bodybuilder that I don't actually believe will actually ever suffer injury. Right. Um, so these, these characters look like they're actually risking something in this encounter and I and I think I respect them and consider them to be like braver for it mm. um, is kind of my take on that um, interesting I will say so Dieter Lisi is an interior artist so you know we might be seeing slightly different styles because you know Dieter Lisi was doing more inter interior stuff and a lot of the other people were looking at um, cover stuff I wanted to look at this because um, so this is like the, the primary NPC in the Planescape setting. So this is the Lady of Pain, mm. who I believe is the controller of the city of Sigil, the city of doors, which has a bunch of portals to other planes and worlds, which I would not have been able to come up with if Ragnar hadn't, hadn't reminded me. So thank you. Um, so that's, that's probably the canonical uh, character in the setting. And, and her face gets iconified and used on the covers of like all the books after this. Mm. So he's very much, Dieter Lisi is very much setting the theme of the whole setting like with this piece. Um, interesting in the same way or not as successful? So, uh, you know, the, the, all, the, all the stuff that you, um, that you pulled up of, from this artist, mm -hmm. you know, I actually really love. Right. <laughs> and Great. <clears throat> so not that, you know, not that I just want to talk about the Met. <laughs> I'm not getting a commission if you go, if you go to the Met in, in New York. But um, and and you've probably gone if you've if you've ever gone there or if you ever want to go. Oh, put, put, put I'll, I'll be, we'll yeah. check for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll put the artwork. It's way more interesting than us. Um, <laughs> It uh, it reminds me a lot of the uh, Arms and Armor Gallery. Do you remember going oh, to sure. that? Right, and so it's this uh, gallery in the Met that has um, arms and armors of so around like the High Middle Ages, but from all over the world. So it's mostly like 14th, 15th century arms and armors, and you know and maybe some some stuff a little later um, from all over the world. So it's not just you know the the stuff in Europe. And this, this huge gallery on, uh, on samurai uh, arms and armors that is absolutely gorgeous. Like some of the, some of the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the garments and the, the, uh, the helmets. Mm -hmm. And they have like very elaborate uh, sculptures on top of their helmets are just absolutely gorgeous. And this kind of reminds me of that gallery. Interesting. Um, you know, uh, and... When I was looking at that, I was, uh, you know, and again, you know, thinking of like how I introduce artwork 
to some of the clients that I'm with of like, you know, well, what was going on? You know, like, what can, what can this tell you about, you know, the art or the artist? And I was just like, well, who are those artists? And, you know, and like, what were the influences? And I'm like, okay, so if you're, if you're doing artwork in the early nineties, so you were, you know, basically our age. So you were a child, you know, in the mid to late sixties, early seventies. And in the eighties, you, you kind of like came of age and became interested in, in, you know, um, you know, some something like like D and D or whatever you know, and and that really influenced you. And I'm like, well, the big thing that was like really popular in the '80s, like you know, people who were, you know, adults in the mm-hmm. '90s, and you know, were basically just coming of age. You know, maybe they were teenagers or whatever. Was anime. So you know, it had you know, and I and I kind of did a little bit of research you know, before the show, and I'm like, okay, you know, the first anime on TV was in the 60s, but it became really, really popular in the 80s, and so I kind of see, like, some of the influence of anime and kind of the aesthetics of that, okay. and some of the artwork that we're looking at, you know, and in terms of, like, you know, the the, the palette and, you know, the brush strokes and the choices that you make of, like, you know, what the, you know, the, the, the armors look like, and, you know, the the you know, the face looks like, you know, to me, that looks very, um, very anime-like. It, um, it's and, fun- I, and I'm like, I'm like, you know, all right, those, those artists, you know, were probably like 12 years old in like 1980 or something, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they just like, you know, loved anime and they, you know, it's kind of like maybe always in the back of their mind or something. And I could be completely wrong, but to me, that's, that's, that's kind of looking like a, like a big influence in some of those. I, I think it's valuable for you to bring that up because I mean, and you you were working in video game companies yeah. in the '90s and early 2000s, yeah. and so and at one point even as as a as a small team manager, yeah. So you were seeing a bunch of people of that era come in with their sensibilities and what they wanted to bring to games and stuff like that. Right. Um, and a lot of young men, right? You know, right. So you know, it's, it was it was a job for the young and the, and very male dominated. Got it. So yeah. yeah, and um and I and I I'm someone who actually was into anime as about as little as anybody that I knew actually. Like like right. I have many friends that were much more into into anime and would you know want me to participate more, and um and I didn't. So I watched you know a, a small amount of uh, Space Battleship Yamato, which was broadcast all hacked to pieces as Star Blazers here in the U.S. And um, uh, a tiny little bit of um, oh, Brandizer. No, yeah. uh, Macross, whatever the top brand name is. Now I'm embarrassing myself. How little I know that? But a know. tiny little bit of that. And then, of course, um, you know our patron, our uh, our viewer Ash Adler is a huge Gundam fan, and so we were talking Gundam on our Discord a while back. And at some point. I should probably watch more of that. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't think to bring up anime as much as other people. So I think it's very useful for you to bring that up. There's there's one piece on that um, tip that this jumped out at you. Yeah, this re- this anime. one really jumped at me as as being um, anime like. So you know. Um, <laughs> So when I was, so I grew up in France. So we, you know, the translation of the titles of the, uh, of the, of the TV right. series are different, you know, but, and there's some that were actually shown in France and not here. So there was yeah. one actually, um, that, uh, I used to watch when I was a kid called Candy and my friend from Korea actually also had that and we loved, it was kind of like okay. a very Sailor Moon kind of thing, okay. you know, and this jumped at me as like, you know, like the, the, and it was a very silly, like, you know, uh, this little girl and she was always falling in love, you know, with, you know, this guy and the other guy. And I don't remember, you know, that was a long time ago. I don't quite remember. <laughs> but, you know, this this particular drawing, like, totally, like, reminded me of, like, okay. the, the male, uh, you know... Um, protagonist yeah. like like you know like oh yeah, yeah you know they would fall in love with this yeah, guy all right. the time right? <laughs> so you know when when i saw that that's what that's when it occurred to me i'm like i'm like oh my god you know or, were all those artists watching the same stuff that I was watching when I was a little girl and little boy and we're like somehow it's all in the back of our mind of like you know the yeah. the, the the visual sensitivity of of you know that particular style you yeah. know uh, you know and it's just like it's always kind of like baked in and whether or not we realize it so you know I, I that that really jumped at me for that That's and great. then when you showed me the the one that we were looking at previously it seemed um it seemed even more obvious, you know, I was just like, oh yeah, you know, I've seen that samurai, 
you know, uh, armor at the match like yesterday. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I also like now. Now I now the uh, so there's a magic item in D and D that comes from the literature of Jack Vance called the Iun Stone of a stone of power that orbits your head like it's a teeny tiny little planet and your head's the sun and gives you some kind of magical power. Mm. Um, and so now, uh, based on that painting, I want all my, that uh, illustration, I want all of my Iun stones to be platonic solids now. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're basically all teeny tiny little dice. <laughs> <laughs> that seems on theme. I like that a lot. <laughs> I see awesome. uh, the- Thiago has joined us from Brazil. So thank you for joining oh, us today. Oh, nice. Glad you're, glad you're with and, us. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if, you, uh, if you watch Candy in Brazil and it was called something else, let me know. Or you know, <laughs> it was just France and Korea and Japan. It's funny. It's funny because before the show started, you the anime thing came up, and you said, "Well, I mean, obviously, you Dan have seen this, this, this in Sailor Moon," and I'm like, "No, I didn't. I didn't watch Sailor Moon. That's for girls. What? Are you, what? It's a clear, very clear distinction. There's a very clear binary distinction between shows for. Okay, moving on. Uh, so, <laughs> little joke there. Um, that's how we got in trouble. <laughs> We were doing fine. Up we were doing then. fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, so maybe we have time for, we have about 10 minutes left. We just have time for one more artist. Unless, unless there's anything else you want to see from Dieter Lisi, which is... Oh, um, I mean, we can look at all of them. There's just, I, I mean, every single one of them is just so beautiful to me. You know, and again, you know, be, just because I, I like seeing, different. you know, like the... You know the the artist behind everything. I mean, you know that. I, I think I've said that before. Point at one of these. Um, let's well, let's look at one that's like more finished, maybe like uh, like this one or this one. You know, I kind of like this, this one, one myself. Yeah. yeah, this one is great. This one is great. You know, and it's got like <laughs> it's it's like a really weird. Yeah. You know, horror Disney. You know, with like <laughs> the little yeah. the little Disney fight. You know. Uh, 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 little rooftop in the back, and then it's like this, yep, yep. this, <laughs> this like giant uh, mouth that you have to go through. It's like, oh yeah, come to our city. I'm like, yeah, not so much. You know, it's <laughs> funny you mentioned that. So, so we in the last month get, got renewed our account to Disney Plus. Yes. So, we, so, so we, we maybe down. I shouldn't maybe I should announce that. But I've been watching a lot of Marvel shows. I've been watching Boba Fett, and then okay, I hope everybody excuses. Is then I started watching the. The movie from three years ago called Jungle Cruise that's got um, uh, The Rock and it's got Emily Blunt in it, I think. And I love those actors. They're so great. Um, and I, I, you totally know what Disney scary is like, right? It's like the scene starts, I know exactly the level that it's going to go to and then pull back, mm. right? And you, you, you absolutely know this like acceptable, acceptable level of scary. Um, and, you know, Dieter Lisi brings in a lot of humor, into his stuff. So I'm I'm pers- I'm assuming that this is like the gate to Sigil, the city of portals, or something like that. And he has he really likes um, beholders that are doing something goofy. So beholders are these floating eyeball monsters. Oh yeah, no, that I love right? that actually to have like this this goofy thing yeah. like, looking at yeah. looking at you. And when you... and when I so for what it's worth, in original D and D, when I run statistical analyses, the beholder is the second most dangerous monster in the whole game as of original D and D. It's like really ferocious uh creature and then here Dieter Lisi is using it as like comic relief and so here you've got a little smiley beholder right as a guard here uh behind the gate and then he does other stuff like that um like I really like for some reason like you know and this is the kind of thing that I would normally hate I think but I really like this piece yeah. <laughs> of like the beholder who himself is actually scared, him or herself is actually frightened of something. Right. And it's off screen. And to me, that like actually that's kind of an interesting story of like, oh my goodness, what could be so completely horrifying if the beholder is actually scared of it? Yeah. Um, that's a that's a big problem. And I I don't know where why I don't know if I'm like a hypocrite because I think that sometimes I would say like don't infantilize your top monsters. And yet, I really that really works for me. Well, you know, I, I mean, you know, we can we can have a whole show about human uh, humor in in, in art <laughs> and, and whether or not you know it's uh, used properly or not. Um, but a lot of people, you know, don't don't want to put humor in art. You yeah. know, and 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 yeah. I think, 
you know, I actually, again, in my tours, you know, I actually point out some of the stuff where you see something that's got actually kind of humorous, you know, uh, because I think it's legitimate, yeah. uh, legitimate emotion uh, yeah. in art as well. So, yeah. I think, you know, I think, I, you know, I, and it can succeed and can fail. Sure. Right. And, and you and I have been talking about this recently is, you know, some people, you know, attempt it and it kind of falls flat. And Dieter Lisi, somehow, it just, it just works yeah. for me. And I like that. And it's like all the, all the slightly funny beholders. And I, I kind of like this. I don't know if this was actually published in a D&D mm. product. The character in front seems like out of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or something. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's kind of like, whoops, that's a much worse situation than I expected. Right, right, um, right. Which I kind of like. Right. So, um yeah, so 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 we like we like Dirty Dieter Lisi. Anytime yeah. I see it, it, it's it's funny because it's kind of not the style I think I would normally like. I would normally actually like something more from the '80s, actually, and mm. yet it's successful, and I I feel pleasure every time that I see it. I recognize a Dieter Lisi piece, actually. Oh yeah, no, all the pieces that yeah, again that yeah. you uh, that you pulled up, I I, I thought were absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So do, do you want to look at somebody else? Yeah, as uh, usual. So I'm go? kind of pushing in more stuff than I probably should. So so if we're going to look at one other um, artist, I wanted to look at uh, Rob Ruppel um, is his name. So uh, Oh, yeah, those were great, actually. What do you want to really look at yeah. first here? Uh, maybe either that one or that yeah, one. Yeah, that's exactly what yeah. I was going to do. So, um, so here's Rob. I'm pretty sure this is Rob Ruppel. Um, and he's working in the Ravenloft campaign setting. So Ravenloft is the gothic horror vampire Transylvania Halloween type campaign setting. And there was a very famous adventure, I think in 1983, called Ravenloft that was a huge, huge, huge hit and in some ways changed the ways that adventures were written, actually. And then I believe in 1990, um, they expanded it to a whole campaign setting, a whole, you know, alien dimension that was run by the the uh, uh, the vampire whatever his name is um, so here's a piece by Rob Ruppel I think showing a vampire in a cemetery type setting with the you know scary moon overhead mm. um, what pops out to you about that so you know what pops out to me I'm just like why is everybody using circular uh <laughs> <laughs> okay you know, it's just okay. like circles and circles and circles. This is like the Dante's Inferno kind of thing. You know, this is like everybody has a, you know, circular composition. This is really kind of funny. It's Maybe it's just the pieces that we pick. Maybe it says something more about us than, than the artist. But it's just like, all right, here we go. The circle going into the sun and another circle. Uh, you know, again, I, these are cover pieces, I, I'm pretty sure. So I don't know if that's like a thing that draws the possible yeah. buyer into the product yeah 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 um it's successful i think yeah um but you know you know but i uh i the characters are different you know for this one so i think i think the uh, the way the humanoid because i'm you know mm -hmm. if he's a vampire i'm like he's not human Good. anymore right yep. uh technically we, well uh, uh, uh undead. undead undead is what we'd say uh about. you know uh you know, it's it's like a very different way to like show a person, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, from what we've seen, so it's kind of it's kind of nice to have uh, you know a very different um, uh, different portrayal yeah. of, of 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 humans yeah. uh, than than we've seen so far. You know, yeah. and all the stuff that we've that we've looked at. You right. Know? Um, right. You know, so you know the point of view, you know, is different, and the way he's clothed, and you know. Uh, Kind of like the callback of like you know his, you know whatever his color and you know the the gargoyle you know it's very similarish, you know. So uh, so I and, you know I like it that you know because yeah. of that you yeah. know it's very different from what we've seen so yeah, far. Yeah, it's a very different perspective, and clearly it's a character that is uh, you know a vil villainous instead of heroic. So they have him in a light that is traditionally kind of threatening, you know, kind of looking down at you. Um, I see in the chat, um, Joshua was reminding me the character's name is Strahd, you know, a little echo of like Vlad, mm. you know, kind of thing. So right, the character's right, name right, is right, Strahd, right. and um, Thiago is uh, reminding us that uh, Rob Ruppel here um, is also did work for the game Werewolf the Apocalypse. Mm. So he does a lot of horror type a stuff. A lot of like horror this. type stuff, yeah. There were a couple of other stuff that you I, pulled out from that artist that yeah, were we really both, nice. I mean, we yeah. both liked this. I, yeah. I got to admit, that's very successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have some zombies or ghouls here. Again, for, 
above the camera angle, right. looking down at the viewer, that feels legitimately scary to me. Yeah, I mean, because I think you're not used to having zombies actually looking directly yeah. at you. Right. You know, they're always like this witless thing that are kind yes. of like chasing you around. Yes. But this is like, you know, they're plotting against you. Those people are like, they're they're talking to each other and they're, right. they, they're plotting against right. us. You know, and this is really... Yeah, it is very scary. And it's a lot more detail. Like normally you see zombies as like a mob, like in D&D, &D, you can have zombies in a big mob, right? At a little bit of a distance. Okay, it's a big, big undifferentiated mob. Right. And here there's a lot of detail here about the hair right. on the one on the right. The one on the left, I think, I just noticed the second is actually wearing glasses, right? Am I crazy about that? No, I think... No, I'm, no okay, I'm, no, I, re I, I retract think, that. No, I'm sorry, I, I misread I think that. It was, yeah. I misread that. Um... Um, so, they, so they all have they, they all have very distinct personalities. Yeah. Right. They have very different facial structures, very yeah. different like states of decomposition, and very yeah. different personalities. And somehow that feels worse. Yeah. That, that that I might have to deal with a whole. It feels like I have to deal with a whole bunch of stuff instead of just like mob of zombies. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So um, I think it was. I think it might have been Shannon Shannon Applekine who pointed this and said, well. The horror in Ravenloft is very Disney. It doesn't get it doesn't get too bad. Mm. There wasn't like a huge cultural uproar about this the same way there was about D and D itself in the eighties for some weird reason. Huh? Right. So All D and D right. in the eighties had this huge cultural you know eruption of how dare you talk about magic to you know teenagers or tweens? But zombies were okay. Right. Who knows? Who it, 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 maybe it, maybe it wasn't as popular, right? Maybe it wasn't. It didn't get enough mind share to to, to bother people. Mm. Maybe the explosion of different campaign settings was enough chafe that nobody was going to pick specifically just on this one product mm. as being a product as a being a problem. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it's 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 uh, it's not entirely clear. Anything else there by Ruppel? Mm. Let's see, no, it's is that is that the last one? We could look at this one, I guess. Let's see, what is that? What is that? Oh, this is nice too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and again, you know, it feels like there's more uh, uh, intelligence in the zombies than yeah. what we used to. So yeah. you know, they're definitely kind of plotting against you, and you know, uh, kind of very specifically looking at something. Right. They're not. They're not. You know, just like mindlessly. You know, going for brains. Right. <laughs> it's just like they're actually doing, uh, you know, some plotting together. Right. So. And the you can see that it, like in this campaign center, right, gothic horror, right, it, it slightly moved the time frame up a little bit. So you could have stuff that's potentially, you know, from the Poe era of technology, mm. right? So you have a steamship here. Right. You wouldn't normally see in D&D. &D. You probably yeah. have printing presses. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Why, it's why I kind of like... Incorrectly guessed that there was one wearing glasses that would have gotcha. possibly been on the table in this campaign setting. So here, are these zombies or whatever are like it's weird because I thought like when I first saw this, I thought the ship was sailing away, but now I'm thinking that they're uh, fraudulently signaling it that it's safe to come in and dock. That's what that's how I'm reading that yeah. that they're you know they're going yeah, yeah. they're they're on the dock going hey yeah. Right. everything's fine right <laughs> and this guy's like yeah 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 just hold the light like that <laughs> yeah okay we okay we yeah agree. yeah you yeah, know it's I, funny i am slow i tend to be slow at reading stuff so you picked up on that ragnar picked up on that it's taken me a day to, to de decode this and i you know frankly in my improv class on friday that was the thing i was frustrated with it was was decoding physical uh, physical activities. That's a whole different story. It's a whole different, different story. story. But it's a whole, it's a whole we all different agree, show that we're, you know. We all agree that Dan's the slowest person at picking up on obvious physical activities. <laughs> no, but sometimes you, you know, you you can look you can look at a, a at a piece of artwork and you just go really, you know too quickly, you know, and you know, don't notice actually some of the details that you know give you some of the clues that you need yeah so yeah. yeah so we are going over time as usual as usual um so uh do you have any final thoughts on D, D art in the 90s what's your what's your overall takeaway from and, and you know there's many more artists that we didn't have time for true but our viewers knew you're going to talk about art in the 90s you're going to talk about brahm you're going to talk about d terlizzi 
Um, I like both of them. I think they're standout artists. Yeah. What, what is your takeaway from from the art of the '90s that we saw? Well, you know, I think it's it's getting to you know more of something that you know speaks to me a little bit more. And I'm you know I was trying to figure out why that was. I'm like, is that because I was young in the '90s and that was when I was introduced to you know the art of D and D or just like some of the people that I used to work with and you know that was kind of like the style that they were going for you know. Um, when I was working at um, a turbine, you know, um, back in the days, um, so I so I don't know I you know I don't know why it speaks to me uh, better I, you know and and I think there is more diversity in terms of like um, style I think that you know and and actually you know maybe the seventies I I, I there, there were some stuff there that I really liked. So I think the '80s for me, I liked kind of like this, bleh, you know, and and then you know uh, the the '90s start to become a little bit more interesting, interesting. again. But you know, maybe it's just me, you know. My, my I think this is how you got disinvited the first time. I think so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a really interesting perspective <laughs> that that you that you said that your initial image of like what D and D art is like, your initial instinct was it's the stuff from the '90s. Yeah, and I guess oh. I didn't realize that, yeah. you know, uh, until I, I saw it today. Yeah. I was just like, oh, yeah, right. That's, you know, that, that's my association with it. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. And, and to me, honestly, it's it's more from the 80s. Well, that's to, it. To me, right. We're, we're done. Yeah. This is, why we, <laughs> <laughs> this is why we do this once a year. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but I, I, lo- I, I, re- I really do like these. I, these are not products that I played with. I, I, did, right. I didn't game in any of these worlds, and I didn't own any of these products. Gotcha. So I didn't game with Dark Sun. Um, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't play with Planescape or Spelljammer or, or Ravenloft or any of these things. But when these particular pieces pop up, I enjoy them very much. Right. You know, the, fu- the funny thing is the only thing I ever did with Dark Sun is that when you and I b- were both worked for what became Papyrus Racing, right? Um, uh, we had to put NASCAR Racing on the 10 network. Um, right, 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 and they right. and they at the, the, so at the same time that we were putting NASCAR there, they also had Dark Sun Online. They had an early, uh, m- massively multiplayer D and D game called Dark Sun Online. Oh, so well, I've never heard of that. That's yeah, really interesting. Yeah. So I so days I would be for a little while days I would be working on getting NASCAR running on ten. And then you were playing and on then, the... right, and then since I had the free account. I would go. I would actually go play Dark Sun Online on, gotcha. on the ten network after hours. Yeah. That's 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 the that's the entirety of what I know about Dark Sun actually. So so great. Um, right. You so you read that. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I guess it's a wrap, right? Mm-hmm. It's a wrap on the '90s artwork. And if you have any thoughts or would like to leave a comment, you can use the comments page. Yeah, we would like we would very much like to see that. Yeah. So continue the conversation, the comments. And, of course, if you're new to the show, remember that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs. It's normally me and Paul, by the way. Uh, but uh, when we get to have, when it gets to be uh, me and Isabel, that's a special treat that we all enjoy. <laughs> so if you'd like to uh, uh, like, follow, subscribe to us, we are on YouTube and Twitter and Twitch and Facebook <clears throat> and GitHub. And also TikTok, even though there's nothing there yet. <laughs> uh, we have the handle Wandering DMs on all of the sites. So look for us there and you'll get updates on future shows. And you can also get audio versions of the show on all the top podcast providers and also on our website or your website, mm-hmm. I should yeah. say, wanderingdms.com. Right. Uh, and if you, uh, if you uh, see us there and um, uh, uh, like or upvote there, we really appreciate it, of course. Uh, huge thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Uh, just move this over here. And if you'd like to join them, please visit patreon.com slash wanderingdms. And you'll see our different tiers. We have discounts on merch, access to our private Discord server, monthly behind-the-scenes stuff. We have after-party chat. Uh, so uh, Paul is out wandering this week. Uh, wandering. So I don't think he'll be part of that. But I will be hosting the after-party chat today in about 10 minutes on our Discord server. So if you'd like to be part of that continuing conversation, uh, throw, throw, there's, we got a $1 level. Just pop a dollar in there and you'll, you'll get on the Discord <laughs> server and we'll enjoy seeing you. Uh, let me see. I upcoming shows this week. Uh, I will be back Tuesday night for more. Dan plays games from the Elder Times. Nice, right? Yeah. Um, that we were working on a new trailer for this week. That's right. I feel like That's right. That we're pretty happy about. Um, In my and, new role as a producer. Right. Exactly. <laughs> super, super valuable. Super valuable. So I'll be playing the uh, 1993. Speaking of the 90s, huh? 
We all hook it up. Yeah, uh, we, playing, oh, no, 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 I get you, I get you. Oh, I'll, yeah, 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 totally, yeah. I'll be, I'll be playing more of the 1993 game Dungeon Hack, which is a horribly brutal <laughs> solo mega dungeon crawl uh, uh, that I have never won. Uh, so I'm beating my head against that, and my character is currently permanently cursed, um, and also I got nice. level drained. Um, so I'm going to keep, uh, keep trying to bang my head against that with the viewer's help. So hopefully that goes well. I believe TDR is currently off on Thursdays, I think. I think that's a plan. We'll probably sync up on that. But uh, if you tune in next week, we are scheduled to have a very special guest next week, Mr. Spencer Crittenden, who is the, you may possibly know, is the Dungeon Master from the Harmon Quest TV show. Nice. Um, uh, produced by Dan Harmon. Um, and he also has a podcast called the uh, That, that Happens uh, podcast, which is again D and D themed, and he also is currently producing D and D stuff on YouTube. Excellent. So uh, Paul and I will be very when when Paul's back next week, we'll be very interested in speaking, getting some questions to to Spencer Crittenden about what it's like to be a big time TV DM. Excellent. So we hope that you'll uh, join us in uh, next week for that. Now, Isabel, your your time is so very valuable. Uh, I enjoy having you here. Uh, the viewers enjoy having you here. Stephen's already asking when do we get to talk about the the art of the two thousands. So probably in season five, probably, I'm guessing. Well, we'll see, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah so this summer I'm actually, I'm taking a six-week intensive uh, acting program. So actually I'm going to have more time because I'm not going to have time to actually do okay. tour guiding okay. or background work. All right. Uh, so I may, you know, maybe maybe over the summer. Okay. You know, maybe, you know. Maybe we'll have a, sh maybe we'll have a short season of, of something as you want to blow, blow off steam from yeah, your acting maybe. intensive class. Yeah, Yeah, you know, apparently I have to take a clowning class, so I don't know. <laughs> did that maybe cause, not. did that cause a huge <laughs> argument last night over the clowning class? Absolutely. A little bit. A little bit. I mean, it's not like we disagree about it. No, of no. course not. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna be there, of course. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we will we will look forward. Good luck with that. Good yes, with thank that you, thank summer. you. Yes, yeah. look forward to that. So don't forget, of course, we uh, the Wandering DMs are live every Sunday at one p.m. Eastern time. So we hope you'll join us again next week for Mr. Spencer Crittenden and another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then, or they will see you then. <laughs>